Grammy award-winning composer and conductor Eric Whitaker is among today's most popular musicians. His works are programmed worldwide and his groundbreaking virtual choirs have united singers from more than 145 countries. Widely considered to be the pioneer of virtual choirs, uh, something we've all had to get <laughs> rather familiar with uh, this year, Eric created his first project as an experiment in social media and digital technology. Virtual Choir One Looks a Roomque was published in 2010 and featured 185 singers from 12 countries. Ten years on in 2020, Virtual Choir Six, called Sing Gently, written for the virtual choir during the COVID-19 global pandemic that shook the world, featured 17,562 singers from 129 countries. To date, the virtual choirs have registered over 60 million views and have been seen on global television. So without further ado, uh, let us offer our warmest welcome to Mr. Eric Whitaker. Take and I shall I shall remove myself and uh, leave just you. Hey everybody, I'm so happy to be with all of you, and um, and also I'm I'm really touched that all of you would be getting together on Friday at two o'clock to spend this time with me. I have a 15 year old son, and this would be the toughest sell imaginable. <laughs> like, oh yeah, yeah. Let's let's spend Friday afternoon with a composer. Um, but it's it means a lot to me. Uh, to spend the time with you. And what we talked about that, that we might do today is that I'll tell you a little bit, I'll start by telling you a little bit about how I got into music and, and how I became a classical musician. And then I'll take you through the virtual choir from the very beginning, how it all started and how we built it and how it grew and grew. And then we'll have some questions, some time for questions. And then I'm gonna pick apart a piece that I wrote called A Boy and a Girl and kind of talk through my creative process with that. And all the time, uh, There'll be lots of time for, for any of your questions that you might have. We can talk about anything about the pieces or about a career in music or life during COVID, anything you want to talk about. And I think we've got about 90 minutes. Is that right, Catherine? Or maybe 83 now at this point. By the way, yes, Catherine- we're good. Yeah, I, I did, up till 3.30. I never asked, am I calling you Catherine or are you- uh, I'm Miss Powers to the children. <laughs> I tell them they can call me Catherine when they graduate. <laughs> Well, I, I did graduate, so I'll call you Catherine from now on. But thank I, you very much. Ms. Powers, thanks for having me. Ryan, thank you for having me. Um, uh, shall we just jump in? Please, yes, go ahead. Good, good, good. So I didn't always want to be a classical musician. Um, it, oftentimes with classical music, it's, it's people who usually start at four or five or six years old. Maybe some of you are like that. That's from their earliest days, you had a violin in your hands. I wasn't like that at all. We had a piano in my house, an upright piano that had been handed down from my grandmother, but no one in my, my immediate family was musical, my sisters or my mom or my dad. And just from my youngest ages, I just remember having an ear. Maybe some of you are like this. I could just hear a song on the radio or somebody could whistle something and I could just sing it back. I just I had that, that in my blood. And I could go to this upright piano and I could pick out tunes. And my mom would like songs from the radio or something. And then, you know, to make her smile, I would just play them on the piano. I'd kind of find my way around them. But truth be told, what I was really interested in besides baseball and baseball cards was astronomy, astrophysics, and computers. I was just obsessed with computers. And this is the early 80s when a computer was a big, big deal. Very few people had a personal computer at home, and we certainly didn't have one, but our, our school had one, and there was a computer club, and so you could go in at lunchtime, this is when I was in middle school, and you could program on these computers. And for any of you who are computer nerds, uh, we were working on a Commodore 64. Now imagine this, this, this is 1983, the Commodore 64 was, yeah, Ryan's going, woohoo. Commodore 64 was called the Commodore 64 because it had 64K of memory not megabytes, not gigabytes, K. So it, it wouldn't even hold a photo now, uh, that, that whole computer. But I learned to program on this thing. And around that time, I started discovering computer music. And there were these bands like Kraftwerk and Depeche Mode. And th they, were, they were writing pop music, but using only electronic instruments. And somehow the combination of music and electronics, I just, 
I, I just, I couldn't sleep at night. I, I was so excited about the idea of it. And when I was 14 years old, uh, there was this call for a nationwide McDonald's commercial in my region. I grew up in this small, small farming town in Northern Nevada, but in Reno, which was the big, the big city about an hour away from us, they were having this, this open call for auditions. And I don't know why, I'm not an actor at all, but I told my mom, I have to do this. We've got to do this. And so five nights in a row, my mom drove me all the way into Reno and I did this audition and then came back home. And somehow, some way I got it. I got cast in this McDonald's commercial. And um, I'll post it later on Instagram so you can see what I'm talking about, but I'm only in it for maybe three seconds. I've, I've got an actual perm. Do any of you know what a perm is? This, this was the eighties. It all made sense somehow. And these really thick glasses and I'm writing in the books and I kind of look up and they take my picture for the yearbook and then I drop my head. That's all I did. But because it was nationwide and it played for three years in a row, I, I ended up making about $15,000, which in 1984 was just crazy money for a, for a teenage kid. And my parents made me put all of it away for college, but they said that I could spend a little bit of it and so I bought my very first synthesizer and my first drum machine. And then later on, I bought a, a four track recorder. And I spent my entire high school career just in my, my bedroom, writing hundreds and hundreds of pop songs. And I guess film scores, you know, things that I thought would be, would make for cool movies. And that's really what I thought I was gonna do. That by the time I graduated from high school, I thought I was, I was just going to be a pop musician. I really, what I thought is that I would be the fifth member of Depeche Mode. Um, <laughs> I'm still waiting to be the fifth member of Depeche Mode. If you happen to know anybody. And when I went to college, honest to God, the only reason I went to college is just because all my friends were doing it. I, I didn't think I needed to go and study and it, I, I just did it. And while I was there, I decided to audition for a music scholarship. Now at this point, I still couldn't read music. I only played by ear. And so I remember going into the, sitting in front of the, the jury of professors and they said, why don't you play something from your repertoire? And I didn't know what that word meant. I didn't know what repertoire meant. So I said, well, I just, I sort of play. And so I improvised something on the piano. Um, God knows what I improvised. And in the room on the jury, I didn't get a scholarship by the way, they didn't give me a music scholarship, but in the room was uh, a choir director, a man named David Weiler. And immediately after I auditioned, he said, why don't you come over to my room? And he took me across the hall and he gave me this, a book, which now when I think back on it was probably Bach. So a four part chorale, uh, chorale, sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses. And he said, can you sing this bottom part and I'll play the top three parts. And I couldn't get past the first measure. I, you know, it's hieroglyphics to me, but then he played it for me. He said, can you sing this? And then I could hear it. Yeah, absolutely. I could sing that back. And he said, well, can you, sing this and he played something more difficult and I could match that and I think he knew at the, the time he could see that I had an ear and more than that that I was just kind of passionate and bubbly about everything and so I um I joined the choir uh he he I didn't get into the the small elite chamber choir I don't know how it is with with you guys but at at our school there were two choirs there was the like the snob choir, you know, super good singers. And then there was the, if you have a pulse and are breathing, you can be in this choir. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so I got to be in the pulse and breathing choir. And, um, and you hear my voice, it's low, so I'm a bass. And I can't remember how it had worked, but somehow I missed the first week and a half of classes, if, at least for, for choir. I had, I joined later or something. And so on my first day of choir, I came in and he said, all right, let's warm up. And so, you know, we start with, you know, this and, and, I, and I've never been more embarrassed for humanity in my entire life. I really, I couldn't believe that people would come together on in the middle of a day and do this voluntarily. And, you know, there was also back rubs. It was, it was mortifying. And, and then he says, uh, let's open to the curie. And I didn't know what a curie was. I was raised by my parents without religion, not as an atheist, but just, I had no religious experience at all. And so I looked at the guy next to me and, and looked over his shoulder, okay, page 10. And we opened the curie and it was the curie from the Requiem by Mozart. And I don't know if any of you know this piece, but it starts with us. It starts with the basses. 
So I remember David stood up there on the podium and he, you know, gave an A and then and then the altos right in sopranos and like within 30 seconds i remember standing in the middle of the room and just trembling like i couldn't believe what was happening to me that i mean to experience that level of complexity and you're all in musicians so you know exactly what i'm talking about right when you have counterpoint moving and weaving and dancing around you. Um, I'm getting chills even right now telling you about it. And I, I, I got tears in my eyes and I, I do what I still do when I hear music that really moves me. I start giggling like kind of <laughs> from my belly. Like it, it just gives me these chills up and down my body. And looking back now, I, I realized that it was much bigger than just the music. It, it was as if somebody was saying my true name for the first time, not Eric, but my true name. And I really think that moment, taking that breath with all those people in that room at the same time was the first time that I felt part of something larger than myself. It was, it was a, a life-changing moment. And I left choir that day, the world's biggest choir geek. I mean, I was, you know, there's no zealot like a convert. I, I just couldn't get enough of choir. And I joined the men's glee club and I became the president of the social club, uh, the choir social club. And in the third year of my undergraduate degree, my, <laughs> my, it took me seven years to get my undergraduate degree. I took a couple of victory laps in there. But in my third year, I, I got accepted into the little snob choir, the, the chamber chorale they were called in Las Vegas. And it was just 24 singers. And by that time I was really starting to learn to read music. It wasn't great, but it was better. And the conductor, David Weiler, this man that I mentioned, he had this tradition where at the end of every year they would sing a different musical setting of this poem called Go Lovely Rose. And at the time there were maybe six of them that worked and he would just cycle through them. He had gotten this tradition from his high school choir director. And it's, it's, it's the perfect choir poem. The, the final stanza is how small a part of time they share that are so wondrous, sweet, and fair. And so it's exactly that kind of thing that you sing, you know, for the final concert where you're all holding hands and you cry together. <laughs> it's like, it's the ultimate choir <laughs> experience. And, and I thought that as a gift to him, to this man who had changed my life so profoundly, I would write him his own setting of it. And really, I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew what was in my ear and what was in my heart. And so I wrote this little three and a half minute setting of Go Lovely Rose. And I gave it to him very humbly. I had some friends help me with the harmonic spelling to make sure that, that I had gotten the, the keys right and everything. And I'll never forget standing in the room and hearing it for the first time. And I was still a singer, right? I was a bass in the choir. So David conducted and I sang my own piece, but hearing notes that I've written on the page in the hearts and lungs and souls of all these people around me, I can definitely look back and say, that's the day that I knew I was going to be a composer. I, I didn't know how that would happen. I'm still not entirely sure how that happens, but I, I knew that was my vocation. That was my calling that somehow, some way, this is what I would spend my life doing. And I wrote a few more pieces while I was in in college, um, in, in my bachelor's degree in Las Vegas. And then at the end of my seven year degree, uh, I thought, okay, I've, I've had a few successes. The pieces were getting performed around. I was getting a few commissions. And now I really need to learn something. I need to go and get a master's degree. I need to get some proper schooling here if I'm going to be a composer. And I was told by my advisor at school that, um, my grades were so bad that there was no master's program in the country that would accept me. And that it was a good lesson for me that I, you know, that I should put my nose to the grindstone and do the work and then good things will come. And I thought there must be some school somewhere that would accept my application with only my portfolio with pieces I had written and not worry about my GPA. And so I went to the big book of graduate schools in the library. And the only place I could find was this place in New York called the Juilliard School. I thought, <laughs> I didn't know how it was pronounced. I thought it was French. I thought it was the Juilliard School. 
and it's the only place I applied. Um, and I went out and did an audition and met all the professors and I got accepted. And I ended up doing my master's degree at the Juilliard School. And that really transformed the way I thought about music and structure, which we'll talk about uh, later on today. And I moved out to Los Angeles immediately afterwards thinking that I would want to write music for movies. And I just couldn't make it work. I tried to get in and I can, and looking back now, it, it's more that actually by the time I graduated with my master's degree, I was in love with the idea of being a concert composer, writing for orchestras and choirs and the film comp composition is a whole other game. Um, since, since that time, I've actually worked on three films with Hans Zimmer, with the film composer Hans Zimmer. Uh, I worked on Pirates of the Caribbean 4 and Kung Fu Panda 3, Batman versus Superman. I only do sequels. <laughs> and and I, I've, I've gotten just close enough to it to know that that's, it's fun to dabble in, but it's definitely not something I would want to do as my career. But I only bring that up because if any of you happen to be interested in film music, uh, we can absolutely talk about it later on. Anyway, that's what I've been doing since I graduated from school is writing pieces and having them performed. And it's a weird, weird job. It's um, like, even, even now you're looking at me and you know, I've got on a shirt with a collar and the, the room is all white and it's kind of clean. This is actually, my wife is having a baby next month. And so I'm in the baby's room right now. That's why there's nothing in here. Uh, it's this weekend is all uh, um, cribs and stuff, but I only say it because you, you look here and it looks like, oh, it's, I've got it all figured out. <laughs> if you were to see my actual working day, it's basically me just sitting around in my underwear and pulling my hair out and thinking if I would have studied harder, I could have had a real job. You know, I could have been an architect or a, a dentist or something, but note this. So basically what I do is I spend months and months alone in this room, just trying to craft these pieces note by note and building these these little cathedrals and then the piece goes out and it gets performed by an orchestra or a choir and usually I'm there at the premiere and that's a very extroverted affair I'm I think I'm really an introvert uh, pretending to be an extrovert and so suddenly you're wearing tuxedos and it's it's all big and bright and I conduct the premiere and talk about it and then the piece goes into publication, right? It gets printed and then it just goes out in the world. Like you send a child out into the world and some of the children keep in touch. You know, they send back royalty checks every three months. Good kids. Some, some kids, nobody wants to play with, you know, you send them out and oh, come back. Daddy loves you. I, I like those, those pieces best of all, the ones that no one will play with. But it's this odd experience where until the internet which I know for most of you is probably impossible to imagine. Before the internet, you actually had no idea what was going on with the piece. All you'd get is every three months, you'd get a royalty statement that said, yep, you sold 250 copies of this, but you wouldn't know that this choir here had done it and especially what the effect and the impact had been on the performers and on the audience. You just didn't know it happened all out there somewhere. But then YouTube, uh, happened, social media, but especially YouTube. And people started communicating with each other. I, again, I think for most of your generation, it's so normal to, to take a selfie or to even post a video of yourself talking or even have FaceTime. But back in 2009, this was really odd. It was a, an odd thing to look directly into a camera and send a message. And what happened was this young woman named Britlin Losey, who was only 17 at the time, she was living on Long Island, New York. She was a fan of, of a piece I'd written called Sleep. And so she uploaded this fan video to me on YouTube. She didn't know me at all. Uh, I'll play a little bit for you. But basically, she, she just pushed play on the CD and then sang the soprano line over the top of it and then uploaded it to YouTube, like, a, like an electronic message in a bottle, somehow hoping it would make its way to me. And a friend of mine saw the video and then sent me the link and said, you've got to see this. And it, it worked. Britland's video made it to me. And I want to share that with you now, if, if, if you don't mind. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. And then I'm going to take this, 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 this. Okay, this. Okay, great. Here we go. So this is Britland's video. Hi, Mr. Eric Whitaker. Um... 
My name is Threatlin Lucy, and this is a video that I'd like to make for you. Here's me singing sleep. I'm a little nervous, just to let you know. If So I thought Britland's video was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen. Um, it wasn't just that she'd sent it to me, but that somehow you could just feel her intention. It just popped off the screen. It was so pure and clear. And also her voice is just so pure and innocent. And watching it, I, I was really thunderstruck. I thought, you know, if, if I could just get 25 people to do what Britland is doing, you know, uh, if, if they just sing in the same tempo and in the same key, and they upload all of those videos to YouTube, all I'd have to do literally, my whole plan at the time was just push play on all the videos and then this virtual choir would unfold, right? I was like, okay, this has to work. Okay, so the first thing I did is I, I uploaded this idea on my blog. I wrote, oh my God, oh my God, I just got this idea. And everybody wrote to me and said, uh, that's great. How are we all gonna sing at the same tempo? So I figured what I'd do is I would, I would put up a video of myself conducting. And the reason there's no sound in it is because there's no choir, right? This, I was just trying to figure this out. And really what I was doing was imagining the, the piece in my head. This was a piece you can see up at the top there called Lux Aurumque, which is Latin for light and gold. And it was something that I'd already written. Um, and, and I can tell you the people in the studio that day that were filming me, they thought I was insane. They really thought I'd lost my mind. I was just conducting in total silence. What's, what's funny as a composer is I can look back now and think that's probably as close to a perfect performance as I'll ever have. The one that's in my brain right there. This is, this is probably as close as I'll ever get. Um, let me skip to the next. So, I uploaded that video to my, um, to my website. And then by that time, Facebook was, was going. And I wrote on Facebook and on my blog, I said, okay, gang, come download the sheet music, sit in front of your computer, put in these headphones and follow my little conductor track and upload your video. And I honestly didn't think anybody would do it. I thought, who is gonna go to all this effort? But amazingly, people did. So this is Cheryl Ang from Singapore. This is Evangelina Etienne from Massachusetts. I want you to remember Evangelina's face and her name because I'll talk about her a little later. That's Stephen Hansen from Sweden, and this is Jamal Walker from Texas. There were, uh, there's, there's a small soprano solo at the beginning of Luxorumque, and so we held auditions. I'll talk a little bit about this later too, but um, in our virtual choir, anybody who uploads a video is in. There's no auditions except for the solos. And so uh, I had this these little four measure solo and I think 20 or 30 sopranos uploaded their version of it. And I chose Melody Myers from Tennessee. just effortless, right? And um, I don't know if you can see the top comment there, but it says, you melt my face off. 
<laughs> YouTube, the poetry of our time. Um, and so all told, we had 185 videos from 12 different countries. And it was, I swear, only at this part of the process that I realized, I don't know the first thing about video editing. What am I doing? I don't know how to put all this stuff together. And so I blogged about that. And this young uh, man named Scott Haynes, who was 22 at the time, he wrote to me and said, this is the project I've been looking for my whole life. And I wrote back to Scott and said, Scott, I've been looking for you my whole life. And um, he spent about three months putting all this together. Uh, Ms. Powers, I'm not sure who's putting yours together, but. Um, some of it, unfortunately, is me visually. We have uh, one of our faculty named Stephen Rader who does beautiful audio mixing. And we have for our larger projects, a uh, video editor and motion graphics gentleman who, uh, named James Crawford. So uh, it definitely takes an army of very talented and generous people. <laughs> Yeah, it's an army, right? It's, it's, it's an unbelievable effort. And even now, 10 years later, the only way to do it is molecule by molecule by molecule. There's no app that you throw it into and just say everybody works. It's, it just is so much effort. And Scott, at this time, was basically inventing what this would look like and sound like. And he spent about three months doing it. And I remember there's, there's two issues. One is audio. And you can even hear in the little videos you can hear a computer hiss or fan in the background. Uh, in some of the videos, there was crickets or there were ambulances. You know, you've got to get all of that out. There's one video early on where you could hear a kid's mother yelling at him from the other room. Like, what are you doing in there with the singing? <laughs> so we had to like very carefully mix all of that. And then um, in March of 2010, 10 years ago, we uploaded to YouTube the Virtual Choir 1.0, Luke's Album Quay. Guys, forgive me, I'll stop it there um, just to make sure that we have enough time today. Uh, I honestly, honestly, honestly thought nobody but my fellow choir geeks would be remotely interested in this thing. Um, but the video went viral. And by viral, that meant that in that first week, this is back in 2010, we had a million views, which was, we just couldn't believe it. And it got picked up by um, some international news outlets. And I started doing interviews. And then suddenly, all of my social media and my website was flooded with emails from singers around the world saying, what is this? When is the next one? And how can I be a part of it? I swear to you, never in my wildest dreams did I imagine there would be another one <laughs> ever. I thought this is just a one-off and an experiment to see if it would work. But the, the passion from the singers was so extraordinary um, that we said, okay, let's, let's see what we can do. And so a year and a half later, we launched Virtual Choir 2.0 uh, with a piece that I'd written called Sleep. That one has 2,052 singers from 58 different countries. So just an, an exponential jump in terms of size and also countries represented. Um, suddenly we had, we had countries represented that <laughs> historically have not gotten along at all. Pakistan and India, uh, Lebanon, Egypt, Jordan, Israel. There were seven countries on the African continent. 
countries or singers that's as far north as the great Alaskan bush and as far south as New Zealand. And really almost overnight, our little virtual choir experiment had become kind of an earth choir, a global choir. And still these call came in from singers. This is amazing. What is this? How can I be a part of it? And when is the next one? So the following year, we launched Virtual Choir 3.0, a piece called Water Night. This one has nearly 4,000 singers uh, from 73 countries. And as people were contacting us, they were also posting on Facebook, on, on my blog, emailing us saying, here is how I came to find the virtual choir. Here's what it meant to me. And some of the stories were so beautiful. And so we started a, a kind of a testimony page um, on my website and people would upload their stories. And some of the stories, even at this point, there was a um, there was a man who had been he had sung in choirs until he was uh, eighteen, and then had gone legally blind, and had been unable to sing in a choir for thirty years because he literally couldn't see the conductor standing in front of him. But now, for the first time, he could get close enough to my little conductor track on the screen. He was able to join the virtual choir. There was a young woman who had been singing with her mother in virtual choirs since she was a child. It was a thing that she and her mother had done together and her mother was dying of cancer in hospice. And so she recorded her video holding her mother's hand just off screen so that she could give this kind of timeless tribute to her mother. There was a, a man from Cuba who desperately wanted to join virtual choir, but because of government regulations was unable to send us an email with an attachment larger than one meg. And so we got together with his, uh, he, we got him together with our tech team, taught him how to cut it into 26 one meg files. He sent them all to us. We stitched together. Cuba became part of the virtual choir. And it was also around this time that we got word that Evangelina Etienne, remember the, the African-American woman that I asked you to, to remember from that, those first individual videos that she had died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 24 of a brain tumor. And she was the first real death of a singer that we had had. And I, I wish I could share with you and show you the outpouring of genuine grief from people around the world who had never met her. Um, it, it's the first time I remember thinking, oh, this is a family. This somehow this, this strange virtual experiment has everything that a traditional choir has, you know, that feeling of togetherness and that bond that you can only have from singing together, but with people who have never met and probably will never meet. Uh, that was an extraordinary thing to witness. And I, I was honored to witness all of that. Um, since we uploaded that first video 10 years ago, we've now made six full virtual choirs. And then two kind of on the side. One was for Disney's World of Color. And that's the, the Christmas show that they do, you know, every year where they project onto the water. Easily one of the geekiest moments of my life was standing, watching the premiere of that and it being projected on the water and all the thousands of people standing around and then realizing that everybody's mouse ears were synchronized to the lights in the virtual choir. <laughs> that, that's one of the great days of my life. And then, um, the other one was uh, we, we made a virtual youth choir for UNICEF to help raise money for UNICEF and help raise nearly 4 million pounds for them. And that was um, premiered at the beginning of what's called the Commonwealth Games, which are kind of like the Olympics uh, in Glasgow, Scotland. And that also was this surreal experience. The queen was there watching this. It was <laughs> just otherworldly. Um, and including the one that Ms. Powers talked about, which is the latest one we did that's got over 17,000 singers from 129 countries called Sing Gently. And I thought I, what I would do is play just a little bit of Virtual Choir 4 for you, uh, just to show you too that, that the musical style ranges in these. This is from a, a musical that I've been working on for years and years called Paradise Lost. 
And so you'll hear it's got some dubstep, dubstep electronica in it. I worked with a, a British producer who I'm a big fan of named Guy Sigs with. I'll just play a little bit of this. I'll stop it there. We can rock out on this all day. Um, so far, we've all told, uh, as Ms. Powers said, we've had 145 countries represented. But maybe even more amazing to me is that 35,000 different people have taken part in all of these virtual choirs. We've had singers as young as three in the virtual youth choir, cutest thing you've ever seen. They can barely keep their headphones on. And singers as old as in 99. Um, as I said before, there are no auditions. Every single singer gets in unless they're auditioning for um, one of those, those few solos. We've only ever had to turn away one person and that was because they had auto-tuned their voice. So we sent them back and had them do a, a regular video and they sent it back in, they were in. Um, this, as we've made the videos, we've tried with each new video to be more and more and more inclusive. And the past one that we did, Sing Gently, that we just released in July, uh, besides having all those thousands of singers, also had nearly two dozen blind singers. Um, it had uh, over a dozen deaf signers. You can actually see them in the video signing, which is so beautiful. And then um, all sorts of disabled people that were able to join. And I, I think most striking to me was there's a, a large community of cystic fibrosis singers who have joined. And cystic fibrosis, for any of you who don't know what, what that is, it's a, it's a lung disease or collection of lung diseases that has a very specific fingerprint, an odd fingerprint in that the a cystic fibrosis sufferer can never be in the same room with another cystic fibrosis uh, sufferer for fear that they will infect each other and it can be fatal. So they can literally never be in the same room. So the only way they can sing together is to join in a virtual choir. I find that so truly beautiful. Um, maybe now this is a good time to, to see if there's any questions. Ms. Powers, what do you think? I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I really enjoyed the explosion of comments on the dubstep that really, <laughs> kids really enjoyed that. That's awesome. Um, we know the way to their hearts. Uh, let's just throw some like Mozart Requiem with some dubstep underneath and we're done. Um, okay, so we had lots of really cool questions that we had, um, we had collected a bunch of them you already answered in, in talking about your story of how you became a composer, what ensembles you were in in high school, uh, what was your sort of inspiration point. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of randomly pick from a few of them. Um, um, Baji, Baji Steele, are you around? Are you in this meeting? Yes, I'm here. There you are. Um, Great. I'm gonna I'm gonna spotlight you so that you can ask your question to Mr. Eric Whitaker. Oh, okay. My question was, um, what advice would you give to your um, high school self, or maybe just your like young musician self, 
for going forward as a music in like a music career. Pachi, are you? What grade are you in? I'm in tenth grade right now. And and are you thinking about becoming a musician? Sorry, what? So are you thinking about becoming a professional musician? Yes, I'm thinking about it. I think what I would do, if I could go back and give myself some advice, it would be this, that um, you know if you're going to be a musician or not. You just know. It's, it's, you've got that feeling in your gut. And the thing is, everybody you know is going to tell you that's a bad idea. Everybody. My parents talked to me about there's no money in it. There's no job stability. It's, uh, it's a difficult life. But if, if you're like me, and I imagine you are, it's like oxygen. You like somebody saying, it's fine, just don't breathe. But you must breathe. You have to find a way to make it work. And what I would do is probably go back and tell my, my younger self, don't worry so much. It's, the path is going to lead you there. You have to have faith in it. You can't possibly see how the path is going to unfold. But if you want the thing and you go after it relentlessly, it will unfold. There's one of my favorite sayings is be bold and mighty forces will come to your aid. I, I have found that to be true over and over and over in my life. That's what I would tell my, my younger self. Thank you. Thank you, Baji. Um, let's go to Sophia Thompson. Are you here, Sophia? Yep, I'm here. Sophia, ask your question, please. Hey, Sophia. Hi. Um, I was wondering, when you're making music or when you're listening to music, do you see images in your head? Because, I don't know, I feel like when I listen to your music, it's so expressive. So I was wondering if you see stuff when you're making music. That means so much to me that you say that, that when you're listening to my music. Yeah, I, I think, even though I'm a musician, I think I'm actually more visual than I am audio auditory or whatever. Yeah, I, I think in pictures. I think I even feel in images and pictures. And so, so yeah, I, I often think of my music as um, a score to a movie that just hasn't been made yet. You know what I mean? Um, so it's really beautiful that you say that. Yeah, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sophia. Okay, uh, let's go to Ava, who is an OSHA student. Are you here, Ava? Yes, I am. Hello. Uh, my question is, what is what do you think is the single most important thing you find makes a singer successful in the world of professional choral singing? I'll tell you, I think there's three things, okay? This is going to sound, you'll roll your eyes when I say it, but this honest to God, after working with singers for 25 years, this is it. It's that you show up on time, <laughs> you know what you're doing, and you're lovely to work with. Those three things, A, A I can't tell you how rare that is. That's, it's not always like that. Um, and, and B, it's, that's 99% of it. Everything else is just is icing on the cake. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? I don't, I don't want to make it so flat, but it's-, it's actually, Yes, it totally does. Thank you. Yeah, good luck, truly. Thank you, Ava. Um, Megan Richards. Um, my question was, I was wondering where you draw your inspirations um, from into your compositions. Hmm. Megan, it's a really good question. And I'd say uh, there's two answers. There's the movie version, and then there's the, the, the real version. <laughs> Both are true, but in different ways. For me, the, the movie version is uh, almost everything I've, I've written is from either um, a, f a fascination and a love of the human experience. So joy and love and grief and sorrow, the things that we all are trying to be humans and navigating through the world. I'm endlessly fascinated by that and inspired by that. And then the other one is by the, the beauty of the natural world, that space and stars and the moon and trees and water and sunlight and uh, um, 
those things are endless sources of inspiration for me. And I think one way or another, I end up writing about those almost completely. Uh, the, the more real answer is that uh, the biggest inspiration I have is the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that sounds, sounds catty, but it is so true that if, if I didn't have a deadline, I would still be writing my very first piece. Because always tomorrow, I think I'm going to be better. I'll know what I'm doing. I'll have a better idea. But the act of composition I've come to discover is really just making a decision and then making another decision and then making another decision and making another decision. And if you're going to finish a piece, at some point, you have to make a whole bunch of decisions and sign off on them. It's the hardest thing for me to do. And the only way I know how to do it is to hack the part of my brain that is the procrastinator. And the way that I do that is I'll convince whatever group I'm writing for to agree on a, on a, a date, let's say May 22nd, 2022, we're going to premiere a piece that I'm, and then start selling tickets for it. Because once that's in the calendar, once they're actually something, there's going to be musicians waiting for music on their stands on this day. And it has to be done, even if it sucks. <laughs> and that, that is a huge source of inspiration. Thank you. I <laughs> Nothing motivates like a deadline, right? What is that? Uh, is it Bernstein who said to to accomplish something great, you need two things: um, a plan and not quite enough time. Um, <laughs> and with that, um, I think I'd invite you to go into your process because we have a lot of questions about your compositional process, and I think those would be great to ask after you talk about it. Okay, great. So I'm going to try this first. I'm changing my sound. Miss Powers, can you still hear me? Okay, but just with a little bit of reverb yeah, on it. Yeah. Good, okay, good. Right. So, so what I want to talk about, gang, is is this piece um, uh, that I wrote called "A Boy and a Girl," um, and uh, here, let me bring this up again. I'll share the screen, and I'm going to talk about it first, kind of in the abstract, and play a little bit of it, and then I'm going to, um, uh, sorry, and and then I will um, play play a video of it by a group called Vocious 8. They're just amazing. I'm looking for it here. Somehow I'm not seeing the sharing. Let me try this one more time. So I'll share the screen. Maybe if I share my desktop, this may do something weird. Let me see, I'm, but I'm not seeing. Let's see, if I do this and then I do this, are you seeing this right now? Yes. Yes. You are beautiful. Okay, so you see the poetry on the screen. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So let's just take a minute, if, if we can, and just look at this poem. So if, if you'll indulge me, I'll read it. Stretched out on the grass, a boy and a girl, savoring their oranges, giving their kisses like waves exchanging foam. Stretched out on the beach, a boy and a girl, savoring their limes, giving their kisses like clouds exchanging foam. Stretched out underground, a boy and a girl, saying nothing, never kissing, giving silence for silence. And actually I'm realizing I can do this, so I'll stop sharing now. You can still hear me okay though, right? Great, and if I do this, you can hear that? And everything's good? Okay, so. I'm, I'm sitting here at my piano playing. The reason I chose this piece is, is it, it encapsulates a lot, uh, it encapsulates all of the philosophy I have about writing music for choir. And it starts with this, a perfect poem. To me, what separates singing from all other musical animals is that we also sing text, we sing words, we sing poetry, or we sing uh, liturgy, liturgical words, religious words. And, uh, and I think that that gives our art form a completely separate dimension than just music. And I believe that what happens is that we engage not only the music part of the brain, wherever that is, but also the word part of the brain. And when it's done well, singing and especially hearing singing becomes a whole brain experience. We're able to, to, to have ecstatic experiences both as singers and as audience members because we're engaging the whole brain at the same time. And so for me, 
everything I do when I'm composing starts and ends with the poetry. So you take this poem, for instance, that, that starts with stretched out on the grass, right? First, let's just talk about that poem. It's perfect, right? It's perfect. Um, to, to my mind, you can hear and see, who was it? It was Sophia that was asking about if, you know, seeing the pictures. You can see the movie in your mind, right? It starts off with that young love and savoring their oranges and then, then the, kind of the middle part of their life, the, 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 the mature part of the love, savoring their limes on the beach. And then the end of their life, stretched out underground, never kissing. You can see all of that. You can see the arc of that movie. And what I do when I start to write a piece is I, I sketch out what I call the emotional architecture. I sketch out the entire emotional architecture of the piece before I write a note of music. Um, I, I looked everywhere, by the way, for, for a boy and a girl. I'm going to share this again. Um, but I couldn't find my emotional architecture version of that. Here, I'll show you one thing that I did find. Um, let's see. So if I do this, I do this. So, um, yeah, well, actually, here, uh, no, I'm going to skip past this. This is a, a typical example of what I start with. So this is a piece that I wrote called Equus, which simply means horse in Latin. And what I did is, is I sit down and I'm trying to free myself from any judgment or the tyranny of detail. I just want to put on the page my, my raw emotional ideas, what I want this to be. So I started with that, this kind of Death Star pokeball wheel in the middle. And then around it, I wrote these adjectives, strong and delicate, exciting, awe-inspiring, clean, just aspirational words of what I want the piece to be, how I want it to feel. And then somewhere in the process, you can see all these number games that are going on. This is just to keep my, my hand moving and my mind moving so that I, I don't judge myself. Uh, in my world, I have Bach on one shoulder and Stravinsky on the other, and they're constantly whispering to me <laughs> that I have no business composing. So I just kind of keep moving, keep moving so that I'm not hearing them. And then if you look up at the top left hand of the screen, I don't know if my mouse is showing up there, but the first melody that popped into my head, just that simple, that became the theme for, uh, for all of Equus. And if you listen to that piece, that's, that's the main theme. And it's the first one I had. I, I remember working with Hans Zimmer, and he's got this great saying, which is, why go with your fifth bad idea when you can go with your first bad idea? <laughs> and I use that a lot. And so... This is this thing that I call emotional architecture. And here's another example of a piece that I wrote called Deep Field, where I start to draw out, this is before I've written any notes or just a few of the notes, I start to draw, here's the shape of the piece. This is what I want people to experience. And not only the, the audience, but the, the performers as well. And you see it starts with static and mud. I wrote low strings like La Mer. There's a piece by Debussy called La Mer. And it wasn't that I wanted to sound like that, but I wanted to feel the way that that music begins. Um, and I, I read up at the top ache, that there'll be this kind of longing, this ache. And then where the climax of the piece was going to come, I wrote above it, reached out and touched the face of God, which is from a poem called High Flight. But for me, it summarized the way I wanted the audience and the performers to feel. Deep Field is all about this image taken by the Hubble telescope. And when I look at that, I they have this sense of fear and awe and wonder all combined together. And I, I wanted the climax to feel that way. So I do all of that before, um, before I really write any of the music. And then what I do is I go looking for what I call the golden brick. And the golden brick for me is, uh, it's a couple of notes or a few chords or even just a single chord that has within it all the DNA to build an entire piece. Um, and I, I put this up just as an example. So this is a famous motive that Bach wrote, and he used it in more than a dozen pieces. And why these four notes? Why did Bach use them? Because it spells out his name. H is be natural in German. It, I, I find that beautiful and haunting, and I, as early as I can remember, was trying to do that. I was trying to infuse spellings into my into my pieces um early on uh let me see 
oh, you know what? This is even better before I talk about that. So um, if, remember we talked about Go Lovely Rose, the piece that I wrote, the very first piece that I wrote for David Weiler, this conductor. If you spell out the climax of the piece there, his name is David B. Weiler. There's, there's the note, there's a D, there's an A, there's a minor chord, which is V-I, there's another D, and then there's a B in that chord. It spells out his name, David B, in the chord. Kind of a, a, a gift to him on this deep level. Um, this is what I just thought was funny, that if you take, um, do you all know Let It Go? You must know, I'll know this from Frozen. Catchiest song ever written. But if, um, if you take the highest note in every phrase, so let it go. let's do it in C, right? So there's that C. Let it go, which is here. Can't hold it back anymore. Let it go, let it go. Turn away and slam the door. Then finally, I don't care. And you see what the composers have done is they've built in Elsa's journey, right? You see her struggling reaching the mountaintop and then when she reaches the, the the apex of the mountain this is the moment that she says the essential words i don't care when she finally lets it all go so now I'll, I'll stop sharing here for a minute that to me is is a an example of a golden brick so it's not just a musical motive that gets used around but it's it's a few notes that have extra meaning deep meaning the thing is i don't think for a moment that audiences sit there and listen nobody's ever listened to let it go and they're like oh i see what they're doing background counterpoint and building else's journey on the high notes nobody ever hears that however i do believe that there is a pattern seeking part of the brain that is always listening and you just feel it you feel it intuitively you can't quite put your finger on it but you know when you hear a great piece of music there's something going on below the surface that just keeps you coming back and more and more and, and has deep meaning to you and I feel that comes in the construction of it, in the build of it. So if we start with a boy and a girl. So it begins with these, these chords on stretched out. Super simple, right? I, part of my own musical aesthetic is to try to find the simplest, most elegant solution to, to big ideas in the fewest possible notes. How can I say that? So very simple and also, it doesn't sound great on piano, but you'll hear it when, when Voges 8 sings it. It's just, it sounds like honey and butter. It's so glorious. And, um, and, and I like the sound of it. Now, more than that was that I started by painting, text painting this idea of stretched out. Stretched out. So what you'll hear when they sing it, they take those first chords, stretched out. So you actually paint the idea of stretching. So like Sophia was saying, already now you fall, like a, 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 an image is being painted for you. You can feel and hear them being stretched. Then, because it's about this boy and this girl who are, are living their life and moving through the world together from the very beginning of their love all the way to the end, I decided that I would make the altos the boy and the sopranos the girl. And what happens then is sopranos sing very simply, stretched, just that melody. The altos sing the exact same melody, but down a whole step. Super simple, right? The thing is when you put them together, what they get is, which is great, like if you're this. And just as a little side note, um, without the altos, listen to how it sounds. It's like white rice, right? But then the altos of the curry in that white rice. Ooh, yeah. I always try to give my favorite lines to the altos. Um, I just love the whole alto thing, their aesthetic, their intelligence, their humor. And so I always try to give these lines. But in this case, the boy and the girl then are moving through this life together, holding hands. They're always like this. Then occasionally they dance. They're just moving, dancing, bumping. In one place, the altos go above the sopranos, but most of the time, they're just like this. And even in death, when at the very end of the piece, they're still holding hands. You can hear that very clearly. And then finally, the key that unlocked everything for me was the last line of the poem. So you remember it says, stretched out underground, a boy and a girl, 
saying nothing, never kissing, giving silence for silence. And it was that idea of silence. And I thought silence is the governing principle for this whole piece. So even at the very beginning, you hear stretched out, silence. And so, so even in the first two bars, like a little primer, a rule book for the audience, you give them everything they need to know. Here's the harmonic language. Here's this little game between the altos and sopranos that's being played. Here's the way we're going to paint the text. And here's this, this building block of silence. All of that is introduced. And it's almost like handing, handing everybody, here's a map and a compass and a flashlight. Now go. Now you're ready for your journey. Right? And then once you do that, then the rest of the piece unfolds. And it, just I'll, I'll say one more thing about it. I'm conscious of the time that we have together. But you'll hear they sing three times a boy and a girl. So I thought, how, how can you paint, how can you visualize the whole personality or character of a boy and a girl in just these tiny gestures? And oops, it goes, a boy, and then and a girl. So, but a boy is just a boy and a girl. So my idea was I had seen a Japanese calligrapher and if you've ever seen them work, uh, they, they sit in front of their, their parchment and they've got um, like an, an, an ink quill and they wait and they wait and they wait. They're just meditating in front of this blank parchment and then they're ready. They take the pen and that's it. The creation of the artwork takes 30 seconds. The truth is, of course, it took a lifetime to get to that moment. And it, and more than that, they're just waiting for that moment. Here's how to paint this. Just that. That's it. Just that, and it's gone. Ephemeral. So I figured, oh, boy. And in my mind, the boy, probably this movie is before any of your time, but there's a movie called Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind that you should all go see. It's, it's spectacular. And there's this love affair between Jim Carrey, who, believe it or not, plays this very quiet, introverted guy. That's my boy. So every time you hear a boy, he's sweet and soft. And then Kate Winslet, who he's in love with, has orange hair and then she changes to blue and she's just, she's fireworks. It's the perfect relationship, right? This, this sweet, soft boy and this, this firework girl. And so every time I say a boy and a girl, even in death, you hear their kind of essential personality built in there. Um, I'm looking at the time. I could really go on and on and on, but why don't I play? You do, you do. Good, good. Well, I, I want to make sure there's time for questions okay, okay. too. So, so why don't I, um, why don't I play the video now of of Vocious Eight singing this, and um, and then afterwards we'll take questions. Catherine, I'm going to try this as a screen share. Let's see if this works. Um, stop me if if it's not working. Um, so, Vocious Eight. For any of you who don't know, it's just eight singers from England. They're rock stars, all of them. And the reason I love this performance is because it's, you'll see, it's just so delicate. They're so crazy in tune when they sing, but more than anything, they honor the silences. They really take time in those silences. All right, here we go. Let's see. So if I do this, if I share the screen, wait, and I go, let's open this up and I go share my screen. Right, when I want to the original sound back off. Uh, yep, thank you. Let's try that. So if I do that and I go to Zoom. Wait, I've got to do this, guys. So I'm so sorry. Okay, so turning original sound off. Great. Then I'm going to share the screen. This, oh, look at this QuickTime player. This might work. Okay, everybody ready? So I'm going to do this. And then can you see that? Is that taking up your whole screen now? Yep, it's great. Here we go. Ready? Is there any sound in this? There is no sound. <laughs> I knew it wouldn't work. Okay, let me try this. Um, but it right. looks great. Right? <laughs> um, okay. Yep, this is stopped. So now we're going to go here. Let me open this up. Talk amongst yourselves for a minute, everybody. Um, Our choral director, Mr. Ryan Brown, if I'm not mistaken, works with Vocha's Aid. What is the official title that you have with them? I used to be uh, one of the scholars, so basically it's a young artist program. Oh, 
but uh, more recently doing some conducting of the scholars. And Paul Smith uh, uh, is coming on Tuesday. So we're really excited to see him as well. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, okay, let's try this one more time. I'll try this in Chrome. Everybody ready? So if I do this, now you're seeing that? Yep. Great. And, but it's not full screen, right? Uh, it is not full screen, but you could click yeah. on that. Now is it full screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, ready? Let's fingers crossed that this works.
coach is just like, shh. Can you all hear me again? Yes, we can hear you. Um, yeah, if, if you're a composer and you ever get the chance to have Voce Sage sing one of your pieces, <laughs> I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's so choice. Um, yeah, the experience of, of watching that, I don't, I don't know if anybody else probably had a similar thing, but first year, uh, it really creates a physiological response as well as an emotional one. You, the, the silence is created in your own body as a listener and then you get chills and then your heart rate and blood pressure drop by about 20 points and then you're heartbroken and then you feel at peace and it just takes us on this journey and it's just exquisite. Thanks, Ms. Powers. I will say that's uh, my, my goal with every piece, no matter how small is, is to transform, right? That you start both performer and, and audience, you start as one person and you end slightly changed. Could we ask some questions about your compositional process? Um, oof, wow. Um, you know, we had a lot of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna invite Aiden Carenti uh, because he had a really interesting question. Are you here, Aiden? Yeah, I'm here. Um, hi, um, my question was, um, so you're really well known for your use of chord clusters and I was just <laughs> curious on what led you to use them so frequently in your composition. It's a really good question. Yeah, I never meant to be the cluster guy. I, you know, it wasn't like I started off and I'm like, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll pile in. What happened early on for me was, here, let me, I'm going to turn on the original sound. So you can still hear me, right, when I'm speaking. But if I do this now, you can hear the piano. Yes, yes. I can remember when I first started singing in choir um, that, you know, the tenors would be singing here and the basses here would be singing a minor second apart from each other, right? You know that feeling. Actually, it's so funny, Aiden, I actually see you take that breath, like, yep, I love that, right? You know that feeling? It's just, and, and piano doesn't do it justice, strings don't do it justice, only voices. And early on, I would take all of my friends into racquetball courts, you know, late at night, and just saying, okay, do you sing that note? Are you sing that note? you sing that note? I just build these, these shimmering, like, clusters, because I just would get wave upon wave of emotion. And when I wrote Go Lovely Rose, the very first five notes are a cluster. The entire choir starts on, a, on the same note and then they just peel away and build this thing. And somehow that Lydian, specifically that Lydian cluster, means something to me. I don't know what that is, but I just, I find it mystical and beautiful. And so with the next, by the way, are you hearing something? Is that me? Yeah, yeah. Is that me? Is that really me? Yep. Bizarre. Bizarre. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, I, and maybe it's a weird feedback loop that's happening. It's super weird. Okay. Anyway, you, you can't hear it now. No, um, we're good. Great. Okay. But so, so then the next piece I wrote was a piece called Cloudburst. And Cloudburst, I'm going to turn on, I'll do the original sound real quick and hopefully it doesn't start again. Uh, started the same way. They sing la lluvia, which means the rain, and then peel away and they build this, this chord, right? And that's how I originally wrote it. And while I was working through it, I remember one night I was playing through it and my thumb slipped, literally my thumb slipped, and I played. And I added that seventh, right? And it was like, ha ah, ah, eureka, that, that suddenly, what I, what I realized in that moment was that it wasn't just that the, the common, right combination of notes in that cluster made me feel something. It was that it actually made me, something, made me feel something very specific. It made me feel the way I feel when I witness a cloudburst. It was incredibly emotionally specific. And so then what I've tried to do over the years is, is find uh, other combinations that mean something very specific. So like in a boy and a girl, right? When, when when they sing giving silence they sing so on silence again on piano that's not that interesting but you remember how it sounded with voces eight right to me that sounds like melancholy and sorrow with a touch of hope it's incredibly specific emotionally and so that's what why i use those clusters is just to try to refine those, those emotional ideas. And then what ended up happening is every time I, I would find the same thing in another piece, I would just quote myself. 
So cloudburst, right? There's the rain chord. That's what I started calling it. And then I wrote a piece called Water Night where they sing Eyes of Dream Water and they sing uh, Water. There's the same chord again, just in a different key. So I would just, once I'd solved water, then I would just use the water chord everywhere. And once I'd solved love, I used the love chord everywhere. And then I think what ended up happening is I became the cluster guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Aiden. No question, um, Amelia Jordan, who is an aspiring and uh, about to apply for composition programs, has a question for you. There you are. Um, yeah, so you mentioned earlier um, you thought you wanted to be a film composer but you tried it out and you figured out that it really wasn't for you. Why is it not? What is it like? Um, because I'm trying to still figure out where I stand. And so, yeah. Yeah. I think there's two parts to it. So the, the first part is that I think occasionally, occasionally you get the kind of experience that you hope for as a composer where you have a filmmaker who comes to you and says, I love what you do. Let's make something together, right? And they bring out the best in you and you find this world together. That's in the best, the best case. Unfortunately, I saw like experience after experience where it really wasn't like that, where the directors don't always know what they're doing in terms of music. And they just say crazy things to the composers. I mean, crazy. I sat in on some, um, I sat in, uh, there's a composer named Danny Elfman and I sat in on a session and this is with a full orchestra, like 80 pieces already recording, which costs like $20,000 an hour. And they're out there and the music is on the stands. And the, the director was saying to Danny, yeah, the thing is the music right now is just too blue. It needs to be more orange. It's too blue, it needs to be more orange. <laughs> okay, I believe there is a certain personality like Danny who is able to somehow navigate that moment, right? Like, okay, yeah, I haven't slept in three weeks. I've been writing this crazy thing. And now there's no possible way I can change the stuff that's on the stand. But let's talk through this and find the blue and the orange. I, I don't think I'm that personality. I, I think my, I would have a pretty short uh, temper for that kind of thing. Um, not because it's not right. It's certainly, it, they could be trying to find the words blue and orange, but then I don't know how to find orange for the director. Do you know what I mean? Like I just, I, I, I know my thing and I know how to do, do my thing really well. I just don't, I don't know how to make that thing happen. And then the other, the other part of it, which is just a, a, a very uh, real world problem is that the pressure and the deadlines that film composers work under are inhuman. They're actually inhuman. They're um, best, best, best case scenario if you're writing two hours of orchestral music, which normally would take Mahler a year, you'll have eight weeks from the time that they give you the, the score to the time that you have to, or the finished film to the time that you have to give them two hours of recorded music with orchestra, right? Which also takes a week to do. But more often than not, what happens is the production is late, the, the script is late, the editing is late, and the composer is the last on the list to get it. And that May 22nd date that Avengers is opening, that ain't moving at all, right? That's for a year they've been working on that global release date. And so what used to be eight weeks is now five weeks, and now actually is four weeks. And then in order to do it, you have to have a team. The only way to possibly do it is to have a team of people helping you compose the music. So you might be sort of writing the music and you've got a lot of people writing with you and for you. Again, that's not my thing. I'm just too much of a control freak to, to work well that way. That being said, if a director came to me and said, I love what you do and, and let's find a way to work together, I would, I would drop everything in a heartbeat because movies are really my religion. I, I feel like all the, all the world's uh, questions are answered in the movies. Thank, Thank you, Amelia. Good luck, Amelia. Um, we probably just have time for maybe one more question. Um, Garrett. 
Are you with us? Yes. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hey. Yes, I'm here. Uh, so hello. My question for you is uh, how did your education impact uh, your composition and uh, particularly your uh, instrumental work? My, but specifically, how did my education impact it? Yes, yes. It's a super good question. It's not an easy answer, actually. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that, Garrett, is um, here's the, the simplest way I can describe this. So turning on my original sound here. So I now know in terms of theory, this, that's what we call one, five, one, right? Yeah, you've, you've learned all the theory, right? Until I learned to read music, what I thought of that was, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh, that's how, that, those are the names I had for that in my head. I didn't know 151, I didn't know A from Z. And, and then I went to school, and especially at Juilliard, I really got a, a classical education beat into me. And I'm, I'm really 50-50 on whether or not that was a good thing. Because take, for instance, just music theory, the thing we talked about. I, I think it's a way of looking at music, but I don't think it's the way of looking at music. And it is taught as the way of looking at music. And I find that it literally changed the way my brain processed music and thought about music. And now I can't do anything. I can't, you know, if I'm in an elevator, and girl from Ipanema is on. I just, I can't help. I'm like one, two, minor two, you know, flat seven, one. Like I can't turn that thing off. I'm always hearing it with that part of my brain. I, I moved music to a different part of my brain. So, so I'm, I'm torn on it. The good part with the education was being around lots and lots of people who were way, way more talented than I was. And so for instance, you said about instrumental music. Um, I remember when I was first at Juilliard and, and I heard an oboist, freshman oboe play a recital and I leaned over to my friend who had been there a while and I said, he's amazing. And he's like, yeah, it's Juilliard. Everybody's amazing, you know? And it was like, like I realized I, I had been a big fish in a small pond and then just to be surrounded by seeing all these people and playing at such an impossibly high level. And it turns out that's the standard. That's just, that's, you know, that's what gets you in the door. And then that really opened my eyes and made me a much better musician and a much better composer. So it's a, it's a complicated, a complicated question. Thank you, Garrett. Good one, Garrett. Um, we're just coming to the end of our, of our time with you. And, uh, and it's like a, you know, we don't want it to end because it's just been so, so wonderful. I think I want to ask you one more question to wrap up based on something that you said earlier, if I may um, put you on the spot. You talked about in your virtual choirs, you talked about people singing from countries that were um, antagonistic towards each other or um, people creating a community whom, whom they'd never met. Why do you think it's important for this global musical choir to exist like it's sort of one of those like why is art important questions but why is this important you know just speaking from your heart what what does that mean to you why do we need that well i think actually even more than than the virtual choir in terms of importance is making music together and i think even more important than making music together is singing together i i think there is something that happens when we sing together it just brings out the best of who we are. There's this phenomenon where the conductor raises their hands and the entire group breathes in at the same time. And you must have all experienced this where, um, you know, if even if I do this, can we try an experiment, right? I know this is gonna seem ridiculous, but if you'll just play along with me, okay, wherever you're at, just, just breathe with me like we're about to sing. We won't actually sing, but breathe with me like we're about to sing. Okay, everybody ready? Good. Okay, we're going to try it again. You ready? Right with me. Good. One more. You ready? Okay, so this is it. I'm watching all of your faces. It's so cool. Thanks for playing along. Okay, but, but what it illustrates is that if we were all in a room together, right, you've done this countless times, it's not only that we're breathing together, it's 
It's that we're breathing together in exactly the same way, right? If I do, without even thinking about it, everybody takes a quick breath, the jaw, the, the face shape, everything. And then if we were together and we were listening to it, you know from experience, it's not even just that we're breathing in the same way. We're all breathing with the same emotional language. There's terabytes of emotional language being exchanged and shared and unified in that single breath. It's the most extraordinary phenomenon. I can't, I can't think of a, finger, a single thing that we all do together that has that kind of impact together. And so it's why I think that what we're all doing together, singing is so, so, so important. I could also go off on the physiological benefits of singing. It's just good for you. Also, it's just good for your studies. I, don't, I honestly don't know why every day doesn't begin with singing, why all schools, whether they're musical or not, just don't start with singing together. But I think it's, it's a good thing. And, and I guess to, to wrap all of that up, just saying that right now I know with Zoom and all of us doing it like this, we should probably just say it as it is. This sucks. <laughs> this truly sucks. I have a 15 year old son and I watch him distance learning and they got the distance part right. That's for sure. The, I just, it's terrible. It's really terrible. And, and for all of you students, you got to know that this is temporary and, and it's a chance for you to better yourself as musicians and as people before you all get back together. But more than anything, I think what it's going to do is it's going to solidify for all of us how truly important this is in our lives now that it's been taken away from us. And when we can finally make music together again. Yeah, I, I know for myself, I will never, ever take it for granted. Never again. <laughs>